Thanks for coming um, to the Building Centre today to um, join us for this talk about Wilmcote House, which um, I think it's quite a landmark project. It's um, taken four years to uh, be completed with close collaboration with the architects, with engineers, academics, manufacturers, and the council. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it because I think it's a very pertinent um, subject to be talking about, especially here at the Building Centre, to learn about best practice, um, best collaboration. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our speakers this morning. Sorry, I should say, I'm Vanessa Norwood, Creative Director at the Building Centre, um, where we're, I think, quite unique in, in reaching out to manufacturers as well as architects, developers and engineers. So we're really interested in innovation in the built environment. We're interested about learning more about um, the best materials, things that really do get, make a big difference in architectural projects, but are possibly the un unsung heroes of the project. Um, I'm very pleased this morning to introduce James Trainer, who's Managing Director of ECD Architects, who led the refurbishment and can tell us a lot more about the project and the steps um, taken to, to create this quite um, remarkable project. Professor Patrick James, who is Professor of Energy and Buildings at the School of Engineering at Southampton University. And he undertook the research to inform the refurb. And we're also joined by Warren Dudding, who's the Marketing Director of Rockwall, who can tell us more about how their material played a, a huge part in this exemplary project. So without further ado, I'm going to sit down and welcome our first speaker. Good morning. Um, I'll just check this is on. Yeah, you can hear me okay. Great. Um, my name is James Trainer. I'm Managing Director of ECD Architects and as uh, Warren said, I'm going to be talking about Wilmcote House, which we've been involved with now for uh, a number of years. I think 2012 we were originally appointed, um, so six years. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit quickly about um, Passive House and Enerfit. I don't know if, um, just to gauge the level of um, understanding in the, off in the, in the um, audience, how many people have heard of Passive House? That's everyone, I think, pretty much. And Enerfit, about a third, maybe I'd say. So, um, Enerfit is the, um, I'll skip past that. Enerfit is the uh, uh, passive, uh, the retrofit standard for passive house, for, um, sorry, start again. <laughs> it's the retrofit standard, the passive house retrofit standard for refurbishment. So, um, the, uh, the majority of our buildings that currently stand today will still be there in 2050. Um, so that's our target. Uh, that is a, a big part of our existing building stock and uh, will need to be retrofitted over the next 30 years, 32 years. So, uh, which sounds like a long time, 32 years, but actually the decisions you're making now in terms of insulating buildings will still be in place then. So you, we really need to make, be making the right decisions in terms of our stock because some of these decisions to upgrade are done on a 30, 50 year cycle. Um, so... Yes, what is it? Well, it's uh, fabric first as passive house. Um, it addresses um, the performance gap, which for those of you who know, there's a, a big discrepancy in, in UK construction between design, uh, performance as design and performance as actually built. And um, passive house buildings and NFIT buildings have been proven to reduce that gap uh, significantly. Um, the quality assurance that you get as a result of uh, the certification, uh, the standard, is uh, worth having and is one of the few measures that actually um, test performance in use. It offers better user comfort, so the thermally stable properties, um, and it improves air quality. So it relies on a um, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, which I'll come onto in a moment, um, which is particularly important in inner city areas. So that's the kind of standard we're looking at, really at the top end of uh, performance. Uh, on the right-hand side there, the, sp the space heating demand is uh, 25 kilowatt hours per square meter, which is in excess of current building regulations for brand new buildings. That's the NFIT standard. 15 kilowatt hours is the passive house standard itself. So it's a slight reduction, but still very, very good and well above the, uh, the, the typical UK property, which is about 140 kilowatt hours. So, uh, a massive, a massive improvement. And at Wilmcote, we were starting at about 190 kilowatt hours. So, um, five basic principles. I mentioned some of them already. Extra thick insulation. Um, 
improved windows and building components, doors, um, and the uh, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, as I mentioned, the air tightness, and um, the thermal bridge free design, which um, uh, using those um, principles, you can um, achieve a passive house and NFIT uh, standard. Uh, this is an NFIT project done in central London a couple of years ago for Grosvenor Estates and uh, shows that it's possible to reduce um, energy consumption by 85%. Um, so that's just the, the, the facts and figures there, um, what that looks like, what we have to prove if we're going to achieve that NFIT standard. And now I'm going to talk about Wilmco. So this is Wilmcote House um, in Somerstown in Portsmouth, uh, one of the most deprived parts of Portsmouth, an uh, area of multiple deprivation. And the building was originally built in 1968. Um, many, many buildings around the country were built like this at that time, uh, prefabricated uh, LPS, large panel system buildings. And uh, as a result of the Ronan Point collapse uh, in, I think, uh, later that year, 1969, the um, gas was removed from all of these buildings um, up and down the country. Um, Generally, I think the, the events of Ledbury Estate in Southwark recently showed that that wasn't completely true, but uh, most, the vast majority of the uh, blocks had gas removed. Um, but it, as a result, the residents had been using uh, storage heaters, electric storage heaters, and they were unable, unable to heat their homes. And um, you can see that also the building looked very tired and uh, had um, lack of investment for quite a long time, and the residents were very frustrated. So in 2010, 11, uh, there was a, a sort of groundswell of, of um, anger, really, from the residents about how much they were paying, and they wanted uh, improvement, wanted change. So um, the drivers for those changes, the fuel poverty, residents were unable to heat their homes, and this little graph here, which uh, is produced uh, by Southampton University, looked at um, the uh, the black bar there on the right-hand side is the, the carbon um, that would have been um, generated as a result if the residents were heating their homes properly, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, World Health Organization levels, but actually of, of the 10 properties that were um, monitored during that pre-retrofit period, all of them were below that level. Um, so uh, that, that it clearly showed that there was a problem. You can see the photographs on the right-hand side showing the mold, the general decay, that, ne that uh, needed to be addressed. So in the feasibility stage in, back in 2012, we looked at um, the condition of the building, we looked at the options for the refurbishment, and we considered um, a standard refurbishment option, building regs compliant, uh, 2010 as it was then, uh, part L2B, um, and then we looked at a deep retrofit, NFIT option, and we established that actually on the, in the long term, within the 30-year business case, the um, of the council, the uh, deep retrofit was the better solution. Lots of reasons for that, partly due to the um, avoidance of a new communal heating system that would have been required if we hadn't done that. Um, so the, the properties still have their uh, uh, electric storage heaters in them that they, they've always had. Um, but uh, as I'll show in the later slides, um, that the energy consumption, uh, the space heating demand has been reduced by such an amount that uh, actually they're very rarely used. Um, we were, just to say, we were part of the uh, Eurofit project, which, um, for those of you who don't know, it's a, a European scheme which was designed to um, study and look at the potential for incremental improvement. So assuming that your client um, doesn't have all the money that might be necessary to do NFIT in one go, what steps could you logically take to uh, achieve this um, and avoid things being removed, ripped out in 10, 15 years' time when you came to do the next phase? So we were the UK case study for that, and in our case, we actually went um, all the way to, well, virtually all the way to NFIT, not quite, but uh, virtually all the way. In some projects, they, they just took very uh, preliminary steps, but they, they all, each project had an NFIT retrofit plan, a uh, 30-year plan, and showed what had to be done over that period and the costs and benefits, etc. cetera. Um, the team, well, the, the team was 
as you'd expect, the usual consultant team uh, and contractor, but it, in this project it also included a number of research partners, obviously University of Southampton, um, who were invited uh, initially by Portsmouth City Council to, to look at the original condition, and as Patrick will say later, uh, are still looking at the post-retrofit um, condition um, to monitor performance in use. We're also working closely with the LSE, um, uh, Professor Anne Power and her team, and interview, they interviewed the residents before, during, and after the works to understand what the uh, impact on the residents was uh, and learn lessons from, from that. And that's something that we'd done with them originally on the Edward Woods estate back in uh, 2010, 11, 12. Um, and we wanted to learn the lessons from that to inform this project. So one of the key lessons from that project, or two, two key lessons from that project, was um, the, the scaffolding was a nightmare. And so we were quite determined not to, to use scaffolding if possible on this scheme uh, because it, the, the project in that case had overran and the, the residents were effectively enclosed within the scaffolding for a longer period. But also um, the, uh, there was a limited understanding of, from the resident side of the purpose of the, of the works. And that was something we were very keen to avoid here. We wanted to ensure residents understood the reasons why we were doing it and were fully on board with it. But obviously, they had approached the council in the first place, so um, that wasn't, wasn't so difficult in this case. Nevertheless, there were lots of challenges, and that's just some of them there, but um, you can see that's one-third of the building being refurbished on the back. Uh, very complex building form, as I'll come to in a moment. Uh, additional cost um, of the deep retrofit, an additional capital cost. Um, and supply chain issues, uh, for those of you aware of what's happened in the uh, solid wall insulation market of the last three or four years since various government announcements, it's been very much a roller coaster ride and that's been, had an impact on our uh, delivery of the project. Structural implications, we couldn't have done this re project really without first um, under undertaking a very detailed structural analysis. Uh, it's an LPS building and for those of you familiar with LPS, uh, it is essentially a pack of cards, and uh, obviously that's why gas has been removed from them, but we had to understand, obviously, the original design, but also the, the, the actual uh, concrete strength, for instance, of the, of the panels, but also were those panels tied together properly? There's lots of things that on paper may have been uh, acceptable, but actually when you get into these buildings and you, when you do this, the detailed opening up as we did, you realize that sometimes that's not always true and sometimes it's not possible or practical to, to refurbish. But in this case, fortunately, although Wilmcote or, or although Portsmouth had identified it as the worst building in their st stock, it, they've got 13 high-rise blocks and this was the worst, structurally it was actually quite good. <laughs> so that was okay. Community engagement I've mentioned uh, and the, probably the biggest issue was working with residents in situ. So uh, this is the largest building in the world to have a targeted benefit with residents in situ, and that brought its own challenges. Um, but there are huge benefits as well. So as you can see there, I won't read them all, but it's, um, some of it's obvious. Um, the capital cost is obviously paid by the council, but recovered, um, or sorry, not recovered, but um, the residents get the benefit from the reduced uh, fuel bills which then enables them to pay their rent. Um, so uh, the work that LSE are, are, have done and are doing, um, their report will be released, I think, in the next few weeks, um, shows the impact on uh, fuel poverty. So looking at the back of the building, two very, very different sides of the building. Um, you might have seen in the previous slide there, the, the front is very much a slab face. On the back, we've got deck access. And what we were pro proposed to do, what we did, was take the building line from the, the green dotted line to the red dotted line and create a new unified envelope enclosing those courtyards, uh, sorry, enclosing those uh, walkways um, uh, within, uh, within the envelope. So the red areas there are the heated envelope and then the stair cores are the unheated areas. Um, still insulated, uh, partly but not, but thermally separated from the um, the heated areas. Uh, so that's what it looks like in section, enclosing that area there, and you can see the, the full height of the building. It's generally maisonettes all the way up, nine floors of, uh, sorry, ten floors of maisonettes and um, ground floor flats, one bedroom flats, 
We were also on the ground floor converting an old housing office into um, new accessible flats. So that was also uh, brought its challenges with the existing structure. The scale is obviously significant, as you can see, um, a part of a, a wider high-rise development. Um, yeah, challenging. Structural implications, this is the roadside elevation, the flat side. But even here, it wasn't possible to do what you might normally expect, which is to screw fix mechanically uh, insulation to the panels because the panels were too fragile. Um, it was necessary. Um, well, it, I think technically it could have been done, we established with the structural engineers, but it, it would have made the lives of the residents intolerable because there were so many fixings required, drill fixings into that concrete, that uh, it, it would it was, would have been too difficult. So we actually uh, proposed a more discreet fixings just at the party floors there and introduced a secondary frame um, to the, that side. On the road side, so on the garden side, we've extended out, as you can see there, effectively uh, enlarging all of the properties um, on the upper floors, so enlarging living rooms generally. Uh, and that's what it looks like. And that's what the detail looks like. So bridging out there, creating the new structure and bridging out to meet the new facade. Um, then we start to look at the, the cost benefit. Well, on the left-hand side, this is what we would have done. The red bit was the insulation we would have put in if we'd done uh, part L at the time in 2010. The yellow bit is actually what we did. So it's thicker and it's deeper So in that particular detail. But if you can imagine, every single detail around the envelope of the building had um, an increased uh, cost, increased uh, work, um, but had a, an impact on fuel savings. So the increased cost... The difference there you can see is just, it's just the cost difference, uh, about £83 a square metre extra to, to achieve the uh, deep retrofit. Um, the MVHR is the biggest part of that, but um, so the extra wall insulation, about £120,000 was spent on that. Um, and it sort of breaks down across the piece of about a million pounds, £1.2 million. Pounds. But then the extra fuel saving, uh, also a reduction in space heating between building regs as it was then, um, eight, about 80 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, um, is down to about 13. And bear in mind, we were starting at 190. So 190 down to about 13. Uh, we had to achieve 25 to hit the um, threshold for Enerfit, um, but we managed to get below that. So um, space heating um, savings uh, appro approximately uh, uh, 745 pounds extra per dwelling per year. Um, and yeah, although it's, as I say, the costs were not recovered by the landlord indirectly as, uh, through the um, increased ability of residents to pay their rents, uh, we looked at the life cycle costs. We also, as I say, wanted to understand whether residents really understood the purpose of the project. So this was resident feedback at the beginning of the project. We had numerous consultation events, and as you can see, um, warmth was key but, uh, and reducing bills, but also the antisocial behaviour, the, the cycle of de decline that the building had suffered needed to be addressed as well and improve the overall conditions. Somebody thought it was about the carpets, but I'm not sure why. Um, before and after, um, yeah, embodied carbon obviously saved because we didn't demolish the building. That was a, an option when we first looked at it. Um, but the cost, the capital cost and the replacement cost was just too, too high and also social dislocation, disruption of moving residents. Um, and although it was in a, a bad condition, the residents were really happy with it. Um, Portsmouth City Council have got uh, stats to show that actually the residents, even in 2010, wanted to stay there. So um, it, was, it wasn't a given that it would be demolished. So lots of maintenance ben benefits, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, I'll skip on that one, run out of time. Uh, the, uh, the Southampton University, I was going to talk about the, their results, but this slide is the only one I've got from, from their work, which is just interesting to me because it shows in last winter, in that period where, if, if you remember the beast from the east in February, minus two or so outside in Portsmouth for several days, um, it, it, in an unheated flat, um, the temperatures were, well, as you can see, um, round about 18 degrees, no lower than 16 degrees in that period. So uh, it completely unheated. So that's what it started to look like. That was the design, and that was as built. Um, 
lots of other benefits which LSE have been looking at. Um, I'm running out of time now, I think, so I'll just uh, finish with some pretty pictures as completed. I was going to say you were time. Am I? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, there are, there are lots of multiple benefits, and I, I want to leave time for maybe some questions at the end. So, um, There is, if anyone needs more information, there's a little booklet on the project as well, so um, if you want information, let me know. That's it. I'm Patrick James. Thank you for James for giving a very clear overview of the technical system. I'm going to talk about the work we've been looking at of the residents, how they heat their homes, has their heating changed post retrofit, and, all, and a little bit about what might happen in a summer case. This work is also done by Justine Natelli and Jake Stephen, who's who's the guy at the back. He's doing most of the work, to be honest. Uh, this is an infrared image taken of the tower block before the retrofit. Actually, it's quite cool. As in, there's not a lot of heat piling out of the building. So what does that tell us? If the building is not... Yeah, <laughs> this is not... It could be two things. A, it's a beautifully insulated building, which I don't think it is, or maybe they're not heating it. And, and that's really what we'll see with these first few slides. They're initially before they were not heating. Um, so really, yes, what happens when you take a passive house retrofit and you go from prior, which is an in a uninsulated, theoretically hemorrhaging heat, to a, an insulated? What do we see? That's really what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so this is some prior data. These are flats. We, we measured the temperature in flats before the retrofit scheme. So that's 10 degrees down there. Uh, that's 18. That's the world, world Health Organization standard. And this is 25. So anything down here is what would be considered as too, too cool. We have flats coming down to 12 or 13. That one's hitting 10. You know, that's pretty brutally cold, yes? So very, very cold prior. And the bedrooms, similarly, you can see lots of bedrooms dropping down to 12 or 13 degrees. Yeah, so very cold. Is that because they've got the heating on all the time and the heating's pouring out of the building? Or is it because they are financially constrained and therefore they're not heating very much? Or is it somewhere in between? So, cold, leaky building, what happened to that? Potentially massive cost to the NHS in the winter, winter fuel payments and so on. You all know the implications of well, that cost is not directly associated with the, the building and the council, but it, it does feed into other services and potentially many more times as a multiplier. Um, what happened after the retrofit? Not many data points in the blue region anymore. So that's good. You know, we're locked in the, in the white region now where we're happy with the temperatures. This is the winter season after the retrofit. We've got rid of all of this and we've moved it up. So that's, that's really nice. But notice pe not everyone is sitting above 18 all the time. This flat is still going down to, to 14. That might be a personal choice. They might like low temperatures. Or maybe they misunderstand the system. Um, and as James said, um, it was particularly cold last year. So maybe, maybe this data is a bit misleading because last year was, was so cold. So actually... So here's the, the temperatures, and this is, the, this is the, the beast from the east event. So that's naught, that's minus 5. So at the beginning of March, we had a few days when it was minus 3, minus 4. It was pretty cold. Yeah? So we've done a heating degree day correction uh, on the data. So what this means... In a house, if it's 15 and a half degrees C outside, 
the internal gains, the, the TV, the people, the kettle and so on, is enough to maintain 21 in your house, generally. So if it's 15 and a half outside, you will achieve 21 because of the internal gains in your house. Uh, if it's less than 15 and a half, you will need some heating to bring you up to 21. So if it was 14 and a half degrees, so one degree less than 15 and a half for 24 hours, that would be one heating degree day. Okay? So the more we go this way, the colder the day was. So this data point here would be a, a very, very cold day during when there was snow on the ground. And over here, this was a very warm winter's day when it was almost 14 degrees. And this is the prior data. This is all our measurements and all our flats. And this is the straight fit line through the data. So you can see the colder the day, we go this way, the colder it is in the flat, as you'd expect. And this is our target of 18. So here, any day which is colder than 12 heating degree days, on average, a flat is below 80. <coughs> and there's a similar line for, for the bedrooms. If you look afterwards, this is, this is, this is a good news story. The, uh, the blue line has, uh, has changed its slope. It's changed its gradient. It's now, it doesn't really matter how cold the day gets. Even in the coldest days in the year, we still, we're still above 18. Whereas previously, here we go below 18. So the internal gains are now delivering higher temperatures in the, in the flats, which is really good. But what would we expect that line to look like, ideally? What, should, what would you hope that line would look like, that blue line, that, the blue line? We would hope it to be completely flat, wouldn't we? We would, we, we would hope the flat to be, the blue line should be completely flat. Regardless of how cold it is, we would, assume, we would hope it's 18 or 19. But it's not, it's dropping. This can mean two things. Maybe the heating system's undersized and it can't deliver the heating. I don't think it's that. Yep. The R squared value is quite low. Yeah. The R squared value is quite low, I agree. But if you look at the data set, it's clearly going this way, isn't it? Um, is the heating undersized? Uh, no. Are people still not heating, which is probably the case? Yeah. They weren't heating before, and my suspicion is they're still not heating very much now because of their circumstances. Um, that's what we just discussed. It's dropping. Why not? I think people still choose not to heat but we've delivered higher temperatures, which is great, because we're trapping those internal gains. And the MVHR system is recovering that heat rather than just throwing it into Hampshire. Uh, this is some data from a flat prior to the intervention. Uh, I just Air temperature means the temperature in the flat. You can see 14 degrees. And then this spike here, they've put the heating on very briefly. Some other electrical heating events, but generally the temperatures are really low. So the heating is not on very much. So this raises a question about does this intervention actually save much carbon? Because if the heating isn't on, then there is no carbon to save, yes? That's not, say, not saying it's absolutely the right thing to do. There is no carbon being used here. The heating is barely on. Yeah. So this is what's called pre-bound effect. Uh, part of the justification of this project is, to, is about reducing energy, reducing carbon. If the energy was not being used in the first place, there is no energy or carbon to save. This is what's called the pre-bound effect. So James showed these slides. I'll be very quick. If everyone lived at 18 degrees, as the design team believes they'll be living, we will achieve a massive reduction in space heating costs with this retrofit. This 71%. But we monitored various flats, 
and we classified them into different types based on how much they use their heating. And this one here, clearly they hardly ever use their heating. So the potential reduction in their energy will be tiny because they don't use, they were not heating before. Yeah. So the claimed energy and carbon benefits of a retrofit scheme in a social housing context would generally not be met. The design team are rightly told, assume the residents are living at 18 or 21, but we know they're not. Yeah. But dramatic improvements in thermal comfort with minimal increase in energy consumption for the residents. So that's fantastic. But it's, it's not saving carbon. It's just providing heat in an affordable way. Yeah. Uh, so this is some, some survey data asking people about after you, you're now living in the insulated Wilmcott house, do you use your heating? Um, never. Yes? But we know it's not maintaining at 18 all the time. So it drops when it's cold. Um, what do you think of the thermal comfort? That's a nice graph. The architect's practice should be very happy. Nice big spike in the middle, everyone's happy. A few people say it's too warm, a few people say it's too cold. That's what you'd expect, but a very nice sharp spike in the middle. Imagine if Wilmcott House had been at high income households. Uh, before, they would have been heating to 21 degrees C, so my thermal camera would have been glowing red, yes, if they were high income households. Uh, and we insulated, and the building would then be cool because it's now nicely wrapped. These people would now be living at 21 again, maybe even higher, which is what's called rebound effect. Maybe rather than living at 21, they now live at 23 or 24. Yeah? So you lose some benefits because people overheat their houses if they were, if they were high income households. In our case, before we know people were their house was tracking, tracking ambient, really, at 13, 14, 15 degrees, with the occasional bit of heating. And now we've wrapped the building. We're trapping those internal gains. So we're moving the temperatures up. But we're still not hitting 21. Yeah? So in terms of winter issues, this is a really nice solution. Uh, we're delivering affordable warmth even if people are not heating as much as they could because they're choosing to spend the money on other things, we are delivering temperatures which we are much, much happier with. Yeah. Very good. The question is, what happens in the summer? This, this retrofit clearly increases risk in the summer. Previously, it was a leaky building with all that thermal mass exposed at night, and it's now a wrapped building. So is there a risk we've solved the winter problem, but we've introduced a summer problem? This is what we're, we're currently looking at. So, now uh, we're in London. Um, if you're a building designer, the weather file for London is almost certainly the airport. Um, the airport is not representative of the city centre because of urban heat island effect. And then we know it's getting warmer as well. So as a design team, if we're using a design weather file from an airport, does that represent the climate that your building will face over its lifetime? You might be underestimating overheating risk, potentially. And we also know what else is happening. Heat wave events, so prolonged periods of high temperature, may be very risky for this type of building. And flash flooding events. I'm not sure that's too much of an issue for Wilmcott House. And the Met Office produced essentially the same thing last week, saying it's going to get warmer and wetter, and buildings need to be careful about this. Summer overheating risk you know, is, is coming. Are we switching from a winter health issue to summer fuel payments for air conditioning? Yes, now we've produced these super insulated boxes. Is that the risk? Yeah. Uh, so this is data from 
June 2017, so last year, we were lucky enough to have five days. This is ambient temperature. So here we have an ambient of 28, 29. So we had a five-day period when it was unusually warm. These are two of the residents, uh, and really what you can see, the resident in the red flat, they don't open their windows. So you can see it's very, very flat. And when the heat wave occurs, the temperature rises slowly and then decays really slowly because they've, they're living in a sealed building just with the MBHR providing the ventilation. The green flat resident, they love their windows. So you can see much more of a day-night swing. And during the heat wave, the temperature rises in the flat compared to the sealed one, but it decays overnight. So what really what Jake is looking at is what's the issue with residents and how they interact with the, with the windows? How much of an effect does that make in this type of building? So imagine between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. So overnight, this resident, they open the window. So the temperature in their lounge will decay quite rapidly, yes, because they're promoting ventilation. But our other resident, they live like this. They, uh, they, they never touch their windows. So the, the temperature decay will be much slower. And the question is, you know, what are the implications of where you are as this pair in terms of overheating risk? So this metric here is an indication of how rapidly that living room cools down between 1 and 4 a.m. every day. Uh, the bigger this number in this direction, the greater the, the cooling occurred. Yeah, it's normalized for the temperature outside and so on. All you need to think about is the bigger this number, the better the cooling that flat has achieved overnight. So our mini heat wave is here, and we have some flats with some very big cooling rates which have achieved, been achieved during this heat wave. So for me, that means those residents have opened all the windows. Maybe they've even opened the door to the, the other corridor trying to produce some cross flow, trying to maximize ventilation. We have other residents. I challenge you to identify the heat wave in this graph. You can't see it. The heat wave is here. These two residents, they, they never even got anywhere near opening the window during the heat wave. They do not engage with the facade. But this is a heat wave of five days. What happens if the heat wave is a month? Maybe these residents are quite vulnerable then because the temperature will be rising and rising and rising and rising, and there'll be a prolonged exposure to eventually quite a high temperature. So really, what Jake is looking at is trying to profile residents. Always shut, always open. When do they change from a shut to an open resident? How many days of exposure? Um, do we provide messaging from the council to... to target residents who behave like this during a heat wave and say, you know, please, it's day five of a heat wave. You know, re you really should open your window overnight to try and get rid of that excess heat. Or during the day, shut the window because you don't want that air coming in at 30 degrees during the day. Um, under what conditions would a building need a, maybe an air-conditioned thermal refuge downstairs in the community space so people can come and access this space to to cool down, literally, yes? This is a wider issue for buildings in general. Do we have to provide a thermal refuge in these buildings during a heat wave event? Because we're not gonna provide air conditioning at the flat level. That's not going to happen. Uh, and we're very lucky, because I'm sure you all know that 2018 was, was a, a scorcher, if you like. Um, so here we have five consecutive weeks of a heat wave. So I'm looking forward to Jake getting the data out of our flats and to see during this period, those residents who never open their window, is it one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks? 
when do they finally realize they really ought to open their window? Because then we can explore issues around messaging and so on. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Morning, everybody. Um, apologies, the fir first slide isn't, isn't uh, on, on Wilmcote House, but obviously that's what we're here to talk about. Um, um, but I think uh, Warren Dudding from, from Rockwell, um, I'm sure people know who we are, leading manufacturer in the UK of uh, non-combustible insulation used in thermal, acoustic, uh, and fire-related um, uh, systems uh, built in the built environment. I just want to very touchly, very quickly take two or three slides before I go into where our products are used, just to explain and clarify some terminology that's within the marketplace in, at this moment in time. So apologies for, well, not apologies, but apologies for the, for the first couple of slides in here, because I just wanted to clarify some language that is in the marketplace at the moment about non-combustibility and combustibility and where those ratings come from. So it's, it's three or four slides on that before then looking into where our products are used uh, in external wall applications, both in rain screen and ethics or EWI, which is where, uh, and the system that was used at um, ECD. So firstly, good morning. Um, Recently, uh, some, some announcements by uh, James Brokenshire in terms of regulations uh, and the use of combustible materials and then looking to, to ban those on the use on high-rise buildings, um, specifically schools, uh, care homes, uh, student accommodation. That was then clarified by uh, MHCLG, who, looked, uh, who are looking at regulations uh, and limit the, the, uh, the use of products to uh, European classifications A1 and A2. And that's the kind of, little, the kind of few slides I just want to explain about, because there's also a conversation, or certainly classifications out there, British standards, which refer to class O. Um, so I just wanted to provide a little bit of clarity in terms of that, if, if, if that's useful. Um, so where does the terminology come from? Um, product combustibility is a European classification system. Um, and within Part B, at present, there is a British standard classification and a, and a European classification. Everybody in Europe sits uh, around what is called uh, EN 13501 in terms of measuring a product's uh, combustibility. And to be C marked and therefore available as an insulation product on the market, you have to uh, declare your reaction to fire performance, which measures the combustibility. So EN 13501 measures ignitability, it measures flame spread, it measures heat emission, smoke and toxic gas emission, and character changes such as melting, dripping, and charring. Um, and in England and Wales, products that are classified as A1 are classified as non-combustible, A2 limited combustibility. Anything outside of the A1 and A2 rating is combustible. Um, England and Wales are a little bit uh, of an outlier. In Scotland, A1 and A2 are combined as non-combustible, uh, and we see that a lot in Europe as well, A1 and A2. So, that, so England and Wales are a little bit um, strange in the fact that we have this terminology, limited combustibility. Um, so basically, insulation and cladding materials that meet the above criteria and pass all of the, the separate tests in these five areas, uh, you then get a combustibility, non-combustibility rating, A1, A2, and like I say, from B onwards becomes combustible. Um, so we're often asked, well, how can I find that out? How do I know? Um, under CE marking, it is mandatory for manufacturers to provide a what's called a declaration of performance. So if you're in any doubt, ask the supply chain for a declaration of performance, and within there, you have to list your reaction to fire Euro classification. And you can see this is obviously an extract from Rockwell's, and the classification there is A1. So if there's any doubt, any questions about whether the product is combustible or not, um, then simply ask the supply chain for the, the uh, declaration of performance. Um, and it's really as simple as that from an understanding perspective. Okay. Um, class O. Class O is not, I know this is a terminology that's been used a lot because it's a British standard, Class O is not a term for uh, measuring a product's combustibility. All it does is measure the spread of flame across the surface of a product, be that insulation or be it cladding. So it is not uh, a measurement of a product's combustibility. Um, so yeah, and that's why you see some products with silver foils on the face because they manage the spread of flame across the surface of that product. Um, that's all Class O measures. And you do see that many products do achieve Class O, 
but they have a reaction to fire, uh, a classification of C or sometimes worse. Um, so you can see that there's, you know, the clarity and terminology needs to come through the, the conversations that's happening at this moment in time. So I just want to put that up because it, it's very pertinent to, to conversations that are going on at this moment in time. So um, what I obviously wanted to get onto, and I've only got a very few two or three slides here, that product then, uh, our stonewall insulation, um, is then used from an exterior perspective, used in, in two key systems. One is a rain screen system, uh, and the other is an exterior wall or ethics system. Uh, which was employed and used at Wilmcott House. So, firstly, I think we're all relatively familiar with, with rain screen systems. Um, they've been in the news, obviously, a lot recently, uh, but it involves the application of uh, exterior insulation on, either onto a concrete substrate or a steel frame substrate infilled into uh, a concrete frame uh, pil uh, deck and pil pillar. Um, rear ventilated, you then have the rail system and then you mount the, the cladding on the outside. So it's very, very simple, very quick, very uh, efficient um, build type. And we've, it's been used in several uh, different occasions, both in terms of refurbishment. This is a, a, pro a project case study up in Birmingham in Smedic, 1960s tower blot, 270 council homes uh, refurbishment project. And it went from there to there and in terms of a non-combustible um, system in that respect. Okay, so it's used in both new builds as well. Um, and this is a project we've recently completed in um, at Heathrow um, for uh, a Crown Plaza and Holiday Inn Express combined um, hotel. So as well as its thermal properties, it has acoustic properties and the obvious fire properties as well. So the rain screen systems uh, are as such, um, and, and widely used both, um, but mainly in new build at this moment in time. The other system, which is what we're here to, to talk about today and, and what's delivered the uh, thermal, some of the thermal improvements um, in terms of uh, Wilmcott House is concerned, is what we call uh, an ethics system, an externally thermally insulated composite system, bit of a mouthful, or um, EWI for short, so exterior wall insulation. Um, uh, quite popular in terms of refurbishment, social housing refurbishment. So you have a, a masonry substrate. Uh, you then apply some adhesive. You then apply the insulation board, fixed with additional fixings through there. Um, and then there's base coat mesh and some render on top. So quite a, a, a simple system in that respect, but very effective. Um, and there you go, that's it in, in a little bit of detail. We have a dual density slab, which means that the, the front face the top 13 mil, is it, Will, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, top 15. Top 15 mil is a, is a thicker density um, than uh, the rest of it. So when it's going on to substrate, we've got a softer product at the back that can absorb some undulations and some differences in the uh, perhaps the substrate. And then the front is, is a lot denser. So for applying render and fixings, it holds the, the products and systems much better. Thank you.